Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you to Sharaf for coming and joining us today. Um, we all appreciate uh, taking the time to come and discuss these very important issues with us. And um, I think it is an important issue. Um, there's often, a, a, I think, an unfair criticism made of, of Marxists that all we care about is discussing the economy and, uh, and kind of revolution and class struggles and things like that. Um, but, uh, but actually, as, as we've discussed over the course of this weekend, Marxism is, is a very broad set of ideas uh, that looks at the broader, wider questions. And, uh, and, and I think the environment, obviously, is one of the most important questions. It's the future of, of the planet and, and humanity. And in fact, I think we can apply a Marxist analysis to the question of the environment to help us understand uh, really the, the problem and, and the solution. And actually, the, 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 the lessons we learn from actually looking at an economic crises, from looking at the class struggles going on today, I think actually help us understand how to analyze and solve the environmental problems. I mean, what we can definitely see for sure so far is that capitalism really has been completely unable to solve environmental questions, particularly, obviously, the enormous issue of climate change, which is the, uh, the focus of today's discussion. Um, and I, I would say not only can capitalism not solve these things, but it's actually really responsible for them in the first place. First of all, we should say what we mean by capitalism. Well, capitalism, uh, f from a, a Marxist perspective, is, is a system of private ownership over the technology and the wealth, the, the means of production in society. It's a system where uh, basically production is for profit rather than for social needs, where everything is left to the market to decide, the anarchy of the market, and there's no overall plan of, of what's produced, of how we produce. And really it's this anarchy, this competition, that, that, that forces the different capitalists, despite what you know, the best of intentions they may have or, or what their personal morality is, despite their individual characteristic, it forces all the capitalists, uh, Marx points out, in capital, to cut their costs at all costs, to, to drive down not just wages and living standards, but obviously uh, get rid of any regulations, any, uh, any, any standards that's, that, that get in the way of their profits. It's a real race to the bottom, really, not only in terms of living standards, but obviously environmental conditions also. And so far we see today that, that the market mechanisms, the attempts to find a solution within capitalism have completely failed. The attempt to commodify carbon and turn, turn carbon dioxide and emissions into a commodity themselves. You've had the complete collapse of, uh, of trading schemes like the EU emissions trading scheme uh, where they've attempted to, to turn carbon dioxide into a, 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 a tradable commodity. On the one hand, there was a massive oversupply of carbon credits because of lobbying and pressure uh, by big business. But on the other hand, the recession caused a massive slump in demand and uh, basically the price of these, uh, these carbon credits collapsed and they've become um, basically completely worthless and meaningless. It again shows you the anarchy of the market really unable to solve these problems. At the same time, I'd say we see a complete failure of, uh, of basically international leaders to be able to do anything. They're constantly meeting at these global climate summits where they you know, fly across the world emitting carbon dioxide to get there, sit in nice air-conditioned rooms, and then uh, waffle away producing a lot of hot air in the process. Um, and all they ever really seem to end up doing is agreeing that they need to agree uh, on agreeing sometime in the future. And then when they come to actually try and make a decision, they end up disagreeing over how they're actually going to do this. So you, you see nothing really come of this. And I think a lot of people in the climate change movement today can see the complete impotence of these uh, political leaders to address something that is an international problem. Um, all of these leaders, ultimately, I would say, are, uh, are tied down by, the, by one of the fundamental limits of capitalism, which is the nation state. The fact that all these different countries are trying to basically protect the profits of their own individual capitalists and trying to export the crisis, not only the economic crisis, but the environmental crisis elsewhere, make others pay for the environmental crisis. So you see people talking about how carbon emissions have, have, have been reduced in Britain, uh, since the, uh, the early 90s, but a large part of that is basically moving production elsewhere and then blaming those countries actually for being high, producers, uh, high polluters, such as uh, China, obviously, being the obvious case. Uh, you know, we pay countries like Brazil or, or Indonesia to, to, chop down, uh, to, to stop chopping down their trees, but only so that the main capitalist powers here can carry on uh, polluting. In other words, what we have is really an international problem 
but, uh, uh, but a barrier of the nation state that means that it can't resolve these very problems. Nation states haven't always existed, we should point out. They were a creation of capitalism. Uh, and it was the creation of, of nation states to basically, their role was to protect, and it still is to this day, to protect the profits of their own capitalists. And if you ever think that globalization has gotten rid of this problem, then just ask yourself, in 2008, what did the different political leaders do? They, they basically uh, saved the local uh, capitalists. You know, the, the big bankers, the big car companies, all of these came running to the uh, protection of the local state and government in order to bail them out. But not only do we see the failure of, of, of the market, but we also see even the failure of the attempts for, for, for governments on a capitalist basis, on a top-down kind of Keynesian basis, if you like, to try and resolve the problems. You see Green Deal politics not really taking anything forwards. Uh, Keynesian-style measures of taxation, spending, regulation in order to promote green industries and green jobs. And so far, this has not really taken off in any, uh, in any uh, meaningful way. And the reason is that these kind of Keynesian green policies suffer from the same problems that Keynesian policies in general do, which is that capitalism's in crisis. There's been an enormous transfer of private debt into public debt, and governments are already up to their eyeballs, basically, in this public debt. So there's nothing for them to be able to spend on the, uh, on the green technologies and green jobs that we need. Um, and so far from being able to invest and spend, actually governments at this time, as we see across Europe and in Britain, of carrying out massive austerity, are being told by the market that they need to chop, chop, chop. Fundamentally, it comes down to the problem that governments don't really have any money of their own. They've only got what they can raise in taxes. Um, and, uh, and therefore, it comes down to a simple question, as with the economic crisis. It's a question of who pays, a right? class question in that respect. Who, well, who is going to pay for the things that we need to do in order to avert climate change? Um, now, so far, it sounds like I've painted a very pessimistic picture. Capitalism hasn't done this, capitalism hasn't done that. Well, fair enough, but what's the alternative? What's the solution? Now, if you read uh, Marx in particular, uh, there's a good quote in his uh, contribution to a critique of political economy where he says, quote, mankind inevitably sets itself only such tasks it is able to solve, since closer examination will always show that the problem itself arises only when the material conditions for its solution are already present, or at least in the course of formation. In other words, what Marx is saying here is we only ever really perceive of a problem in society when already the material conditions have grown within society to go about solving that problem. In other words, today, in regards to the environmental question, and climate change in particular, it's only when we actually started realising the problems of climate change that capitalism by that point had already created the means by which we could solve these very problems. We, we, we have a knowledge now of, of the problem facing us, but we also now have the technologies and the wealth in society to actually go about addressing these problems. For example, take the example of money. If I've said governments don't have the money to solve this problem, but the point is that obviously the wealth does exist out there, but it's concentrated in the hands of a tiny few, of private individuals. One only has to look at the, uh, the staggering statistics of inequality produced by charities like Oxfam, where 85 billionaires, I think it was, uh, in 2013, controlled as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. And obviously that wealth that exists out there and could be used will only be used under capitalism if it can be invested to make a profit. So currently you have something like 600 billion worldwide spent by uh, fossil fuel companies in searching for, for new sources of oil, gas and coal and so forth. And there's 600 billion more actually spent by the capitalist governments across the world subsidizing these very industries. That's not to mention, obviously, the trillions being spent worldwide on military and weapons, where what, what do we do with these? We go and invade countries which have enormous amounts of, uh, of deserts where we could be putting solar panels, but instead we drill below the sand to get the oil underneath and spend millions on the military means in order to invade the countries to do so. And on top of that, I'd say even more fundamental within capitalism is the fact that there is trillions sitting idle in the bank accounts of these big businesses, of the rich, that isn't being used, that isn't being invested, that isn't being put to productive use and to, to solve these societal problems. You have 750 billion in the bank accounts of big business in Britain. You have something like $2 trillion uh, in the US that sits idle. Apple alone sits on, sits on $200 billion that it doesn't invest. So the point is, under capitalism, the money is there. It just sits idle because of the lack of uh, profitability for the capitalists. 
And I should also say, as someone who used to be involved uh, in environmental engineering research, that was my, my, uh, my, my, my previous history, if you like, before uh, being a full-time revolutionary, uh, was, uh, was as an environmental engineer. And I can tell you for a fact that the technology exists to solve these problems. But again, it's not a scientific problem. It's, again, the, the real problem is the question of ownership, is the, the barrier of private ownership. Obviously, there's the, the, the private ownership of ideas themselves, intellectual property rights, uh, whereby different companies basically, again, because of competition, different companies are set against each other to, to create technology. And, uh, and, and they can't share what should be a, a global resource, the ideas that humanity has created. And rather than coordinating in, an investment and, uh, and coordinating efforts and intellectual efforts to solve these problems, instead companies are set against each other. And the only people who ever benefit from that really are the lawyers who, uh, who make billions in the court cases when, when these different companies uh, um, sue each other. The other thing you should add in terms of technology, there is no one technology. There is no one silver bullet that's going to solve these problems. Rather, there's multiple technologies that, if integrated together as part of a plan of production, could go about solving these things. Whether it's uh, renew you know, combining renewable energies, where obviously the sun doesn't always shine at the same time as uh, when you need energy uh, in your house. But if you were integrating houses with electric cars, with renewable energies, you could store these things and, uh, and there'd be a, a, an integrated plan that could uh, be far more efficient than, than what we have at the moment. But obviously such an integrated plan requires a plan. And, and, and how can that be possible under private ownership, under the competition and anarchy of capitalism, where everyone is set against each other, uh, all these companies uh, are, are involved in competition with one another. So the means to solve these problems obviously uh, exists. It's not a question, actually, of, of scarcity in society. There's, there's clearly uh, uh, enough food, for example, in the world to feed the world's population. But as Marx pointed out, it's not a problem of production, but of, of distribution. Marx notes in the, in the Communist Manifesto, for example, he says the famines we see under capitalism are, are unique in the history of mankind because they're no longer a case of famine where there's not enough to go around, but rather there's too much, he said, overproduction, too much commerce, too much industry, too much means of subsistence. In other words, there's poverty amidst plenty. That's the only... Uh, the only situation that capitalism knows because capitalism doesn't recognize social needs when it talks about demand what it means is the ability to pay the, the money that's in your wallet not the uh, the needs of the belly um, and in that sense the famines we see today for example are not natural disasters they're entirely man-made and in fact most of the time when you see famines it's actually in countries that are, are net exporters of food but more precisely they're not man-made they're capitalist made I should add and in fact, I would go so far as to say there's no such thing really in society today as a natural disaster. Obviously, there are certain accidental events, if you like, or at, not accidental uh, in, 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 a, in a, you know, whoopsie-daisy sort of way, but uh, as in uh, accidental in the sense of, you know, whether, whether uh, uh, a weather effect, you know, a climate event happens here or there or any particular time, we can't predict these things uh, with, with any particular accuracy. But obviously, uh, the, 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 the fact that there are climate-related events hitting the planet uh, all the time, uh, whether it's flooding or droughts and so forth, but the impacts they have are not natural. The impacts they have on society are entirely due to economic development. How is it that you've got a country like Bangladesh, where, where millions of people are at threat of drowning and, and flooding all the time, but a country like Holland is half underwater and no one even seems to notice? Uh, the point is, it's a question of economic development. The countries like Bangladesh, through centuries of, of colonialization, of imperialism, of capitalism, have been, uh, have been kept underdeveloped, whilst obviously the advanced capitalist countries are able to resolve these problems uh, more easily as they, as they arise. So the, the try, thing I'm trying to emphasize here is that the problem really isn't, isn't financial, it's not scientific. The money and the technology exist. The question is, as I said earlier, a question of private ownership. It's a class question about who owns and controls the wealth and the technology in society. At the end of the day, you can't plan what you don't control and you can't control what you don't own. So I would say as a Marxist, and Marxists say in general, 
the fundamental question has to be eliminating this barrier of private ownership. It has to be about the fundamental demand has to be to take the wealth and technology that exists out of private hands and put it under a common, rational, democratic plan of production. This is what we mean as Marxists by a revolution. It means a fundamental transformation of society, a revolutionary change in how we run and organize and plan society. Now, there's many good, uh, good intention climate scientists and environmental activists, I would say, in the movement today. Uh, but the problem is, a lot of the time, the, you see the, the, the whole approach, the whole strategy of these people is, uh, is to imagine that we can persuade the capitalists and the world leaders that are out there through kind of motive or, or a motive or moral language and arguments. Basically, fundamentally, you know, the idea that we, you know, we've got to appeal to people on the idea that, you know, an urgent appeal. If we don't act now, then it's going to be too late in the future. And this is the whole tone of, if you read uh, even the, the official reports from the UN, the, the International Panel of Climate Change, the latest report is all along this line of, you know, we've got to do something now. We urgently need to act. A kind of an, a, an urgent appeal to the uh, world leaders and, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the ruling class. But the problem is, with this approach, is that you can't expect to have a rational debate with people who defend an entirely irrational system. I mean, look at the irrationality of capitalism that confronts us every day. We have a system whereby we have homelessness alongside empty mansions. We have a system whereby there's mass unemployment alongside people who have to work two or three jobs and, and, and 50 or 60 hours a week. We have austerity, on the one hand, alongside clearly seeing that the rich are getting richer and there's an enormous amount of wealth in society. The point is, as I say, capitalism isn't about morality. It's not about rationality, even. It's, uh, it's about benefiting the, uh, the tiny few. We can't persuade, really, these people with such arguments. And even, I would go further to say, you can't persuade such people with economic arguments, either, in the sense that you read uh, reports like the Stern report from about a decade ago and, and other ones such similar recently. It's all about costs and benefits of, of averting climate change. You know, if we do something now, how much money in terms of impacts would it save in the future? Uh, but the, the problem is that, again, the ruling class doesn't listen to such uh, kind of rational economic arguments. In fact, this was pointed out even by one of the scientists on the International Panel of Climate Change who got uh, admonished for, 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 for speaking out on his views. But he said, it's a guy called Professor Richard Toll, he's at the University of Sussex, and he said, look, you're not going to persuade people with economic arguments uh, about the impacts of climate change, because the governments you're appealing to are already in making even worse impacts on living standards to their populations through austerity than even the worst predictions of climate change. In other words, how are you going to go and tell, tell uh, the government in Spain, for example, about the, uh, the, 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 the dramatic effect of uh, climate change? Um, how, are you going to, how are you going to convince them otherwise uh, about the economic costs of, of climate change when this very same government, that for the benefit of the capitalists, is already cutting living standards far worse than, than even these worse uh, impacts? So we can't expect, you know, apocalyptic scenarios uh, to, to, to divert the actions of, uh, of the capitalists. Um, and in fact, it's, it's by looking at what's going on in, in particularly, for example, in Greece, that we can see this very problem, that, that, that at the end of the day, it's not even the governments really who are in control. Uh, when we look at Greece right now and the events taking place this very moment, we can see that the, uh, the governments aren't in control of, of their own economy, of the, of the lives of their own people, that it's all being left down really to the real dictatorship, which is the dictatorship of the bankers, of capital, the, the, who really decide all the policies and the real decisions in society, particularly over, obviously, questions of job and investment. Again, you can't control what you don't own. And really, to, to, to sum it up, we can't expect to be able to persuade the capitalists to save this planet because they already live on an entirely different planet from the rest of us. They already live in a world of uh, air-conditioned uh, malls, of uh, sunny beaches and private islands where they're not going to be affected by these things uh, at all. And in that sense, there's really, I'd say, no such thing as, as responsible or, or kind of green capitalism. The cuts in austerity we see today aren't ideological. Uh, it's not just a question of neoliberalism or, or the nasty Tories here in Britain. All of the austerity we see across the world today, and, and, and Britain as well, is no exception to this. All of this flows from the laws and the logic of capitalism itself. It flows from the question of private ownership 
of competition, production for profit. And if you accept capitalism, you have to accept the laws and logic of capitalism. You have to accept the austerity that flows for it. In this sense, I would say that, the, 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 you know, it's excellent, I would say, that the, the Greens have, uh, have risen in popularity and membership. And it's, 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 it's an excellent development because it shows that there's, there's people looking for something far to the left of Labour. And, uh, and, and, uh, and obviously the, the popularity of leaders like Jeremy Corbyn for Labour is a similar example. It shows that an anti-austerity program that's, uh, that's aimed at making the rich pay for the crisis, it shows that is, uh, is, is an attractive, an extremely attractive uh, program for young people today. And uh, it shows that people are looking for a real left alternative. And obviously the huge turnout last weekend, which was uh, supported by the Green Party, which itself had a, an enormous turnout. All of this shows the, uh, the radicalization that exists and the people looking for a genuine alternative to austerity and to capitalism. But I would also say that a true friend points out the problems that lie ahead. As I said, there can be no responsible capitalism and it, it, we need to go beyond demands for just taxing the rich, which in any case just leads to uh, capital uh, strike and a, a strike of investment we need to be putting forward, uh, as I said, demands to actually take real control over the economy, to nationalize the banks, put these under democratic control, to open up the books on big business to see who really uh, isn't paying their fair share and to put these industries under workers' control uh, in order to do so. The fact is you can't just regulate industry. And in fact, Ed Miliband saw that before the election when he tried to regulate the energy industry, promising uh, energy uh, price freezes. What was the result? It was the, actually the opposite of what he intended, where actually suddenly all the energy companies said, well, if you do this, there'll be no investment in energy and uh, the lights will go out, or we'll just raise the prices before you even get into power. In other words, you see the, ability, the, the attempts to regulate capitalism and, and try and reform it actually just end up leading to the opposite of, uh, of what it intends to. We need to be putting forward uh, demands to take control over the main levers of the economy uh, and, to, and, and to use these to implement a green plan of production. And that means transport, construction, housing, energy, and obviously the banks which have the money to fund them. It's not just about taxing the rich to redistribute the wealth. It has to be about taking over the means by which the wealth in society is created. So we can go about tackling the crisis of living standards and obviously the climate crisis and the crisis of the environment also. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for inviting the Green Party to speak uh, today. I'm very much looking forward to doing so and to the ensuing debate. And Adam has already provided much um, food for stimulation and reflection. There are three uh, main areas that I want to cover in this uh, short, short presentation. Firstly, I want, I'd quite like us to remind ourselves what exactly the environmental stroke climate change problem is and how urgent that's become. Secondly, I'd like to look a little bit about what I might describe as our current social dysfunction, uh, particularly in the guise of overconsumption. And thirdly, I'd like to suggest or have us think about what social transformation might look like. So firstly, on climate change itself, I think it's notable that we don't have here on the panel our friend, the climate change denier, or if we're lucky, the climate change sceptic, which isn't quite the same proposition. That's a kind of false bias that the media like to entertain and wheel in. There is a scientific consensus about the happening of climate change, of man-made, person-made, but generally as men who are responsible for a lot of it, overconsumption and climate change impacts, particularly post-industrial revolution. And you can look at the graphs. Either they're exponential or very exponential in terms of temperature increase and carbon production levels globally. 
and it's often said that we need to keep ourselves within a two degrees increase, two degrees Celsius increase. Some say that if we stopped all carbon production now, carbon consumption, carbon production, there's enough lag in the system that we're already going over that mark anyway into the future. If somehow the human race, regrettable though that would be, were wiped out now, we might still already be heading for that greater than two degrees C increase. So the problem is pressing, it's pretty much urgent. I think worth mentioning now under this head is how one central way in which the Green Party differs from another, a lot of other political parties is our long-termism. Our visions, our vision and values are such that we don't think that politics is just about looking after number one. Important that that might be. We're not saying that the well-being of the individual in society isn't important, but it's a very limited conception of what politics has to offer. Even moving beyond the individual to their immediate family, we're about a lot more than that. We're about social justice and all that that entails for the quality of lives of our near neighbours, our faraway neighbours and the 21,000 people dying a day roughly of malnutrition and preventable disease around the world. Let those plights of those individuals and what we can do to do, what we can do to improve their lives or what we're failing to do, let those questions weigh in our consciousness as politicians, would-be politicians or members of society who give a damn. But it's not just about human beings, it's about other than human animals, who at the moment we're using, human civilizations are using unrelentingly for their agricultural production or in animal experimentations. We don't think that animals can be put solely to the use of human beings and that they have value in their own right, not that not simply that they have the capacity to feel pain, but they're sentient creatures, and we should be thinking about our treatment of them as well. And moreover, the countless other species that we share this beautiful planet with. That's what politics has to engage with as well. In fact, biologists can't put a number on the number of species in the planet, on the planet. But we know that given a fairly modest figure of 10 billion or so, and a 0.01% extinction rate that we're responsible for as a race, as a species rather, that contributes towards some tens of possibly millions of species extinction a year. And some of those species, maybe we don't fancy being around much longer like the Ebola virus, but there are plenty of others I think which we should care about and would have some intrinsic value. Climate change, as has already been suggested, is a justice issue. So let's just see what that means. Um, people, UN regularly produces figures now showing what the climate change impact is on particularly those in low-lying coastal areas, like Bangladesh. They are at the sharp end of the West's, the negative consequences of the West's overconsumption activities and there's a double injustice there. Firstly these people are least responsible for those climate change impacts. They don't have or enjoy that right to overconsume or that entitlement. They're not the ones engaging in riots at Asda superstores on Black Friday ahead of Christmas and moreover they are least able to afford the remedial action required to contend with those negative impacts. So there's a double injustice there, if ever there was. And uh, just to take issue, which I hope there will be an opportunity to, because although we're, to some extent, amongst like-minded individuals, it's good to have a little bit of dissent. Um, in so-called, uh, I think Adam put it, um, advanced uh, capitalist societies, like the United Kingdom, no, we aren't very good at protecting ourselves from the climate change impacts that we've already been experiencing. Tewkesbury and Boss Castle try and saying that to them. In terms of the investment in levees or flood defences, we're not doing that either. So climate is a justice issue. 
Uh, Stern, which I think was, uh, although it might feel like a decade, I think it's half a decade now, Stern did try and frame the issue in terms of expense, expenditure, the economic system and what it would cost to carry on like business as usual scenario and how it would be not just more profitable but uh, good for the bottom line to pursue a, a, a path of sustainability. I, I put it to you that that is a, a, a false way of framing the issue. It's not radical enough, and I'll come to that in a moment. So what is our biggest, secondly, problem in, in Western societies? And there's also a question here about what rights we have to suggest to others in the so-called developing countries not to pursue our same economic development, that developmental pathway. There's a, um, a risk of being uh, neo-colonialist or post-colonialist in suggesting to, to other people, um, even China and India, that you can't pursue this path of economic growth like there's no tomorrow, which is a kind of American dream that we've been sold a lie about. And why is that a lie? Because even public attitude survey in this country, very interesting uh, information. If you ask people um, about their earnings, they'll tell you that the more they earn, the more they think they can't afford what they really need. Now, the more, that, the more you earn, the more you think apparently you can't afford what you really need. That can't be because you don't have more capital with which to buy more stuff. It's just that you find that when you get the, that stuff, that you've satisfied your desire and you just generate and create ever more insatiable, more increasingly difficult to satisfy desires. And that's a kind of a trap which capitalism and overconsumption gets us into through advertising and all the rest of it. But moreover, the lesson there is, is that these goods don't actually make you happier by your own admission. They just, act, they just have a tendency to keep you dissatisfied. And that's something worth bearing in mind. And if anything, it's not that we're asking others not to pursue our development path because it's good. It's hopefully that we're in a position to say it ain't as good as you've been told. That's the lie. It's not something which um, is better than your current developmental path or that you aren't already managing to achieve, quality of life that is, without this kind of economic system. If you look at the, the recent joiners to the European Union, for example, uh, even going far back as Poland, there are many farmers there who had their lands then um, taken over by multinational supermarkets and all the rest of it. And they then found themselves more impoverished because they weren't able to earn enough to be able to afford to buy back food that they themselves were able to grow on their own land to feed their families. And that is just shows up the ridiculousity, the preposterousness of our economic system, that it's not actually enabling people those basic needs in society, which is what social justice, socialism is and should be about. Now, to bring in uh, maybe even Marx at this point, and I think many of the things that Marx talks about and the frame, the way that uh, political theorists um, and contemporaries and people before him, Hobbes, Rousseau, and others, the way that they frame their debate is not just one in terms of political legitimacy and due accountability of our leaders and the structures which they, God forbid, seek to impose upon us, but it's also entailing human nature assumptions. And there's a great line in, in Marx, actually, which I think gets overlooked, and he talks about this. The more you find value in external things, the less you find value in yourself. The more you find value, I have a tendency today to repeat myself when I think something's very important. So the more you find value in external things, the less you find value in yourself. And I think that's a great psychological insight, actually. And it does bear out in current society the kind of emptiness. I know that's a kind of a metaphor for what people can feel, but you do find that amongst people, even those who are presumably rich and very capable and capable of insulating themselves from the so-called antisocial behaviour of society and the crime and all the rest of it through gated communities, how are they actually living? They're living a, a kind of an asocial existence, an atomised existence, 
we're at risk of becoming like them if we think that they're worth imitating. But that's an emptiness about life. And that, our, our economy encourages that because it commodifies and it fails to value things according to their true worth. We can talk about negative externalities as somehow our helping ourselves to all the goods that nature has to offer without paying nature back. There's no way at the moment in which those goods are properly recorded. We're not going to be paying our debt back to planet Earth. But the real problem here, another constituency of interest, if you will, spoken about our immediate neighbours, people halfway around the world, other human animals and other species, another constitu constituency of interest is future human generations. People who aren't around yet, 50, 100 years into the future. We can't identify them, we can't name them, but we know that if they're lucky, there'll still be a home for them on planet Earth and there'll be a set of people like you and me, if their genetic engineering hasn't had its way. But what are we leaving behind for them? Are we leaving, as, as Locke might put it, as much and as good for them? We have finite resources on the planet, land being one of them. How are we carving it out? How are we distributing it? Are we concentrating that wealth, effectively a convention, a power relation, in the hands of a few, the 1% as opposed to the 99%? That's exactly what we're doing. So um, overconsumption, I think, is a trap. It's a trap of our own making. It's something that in our better moments we actually realise it doesn't make us happier. And the things, the common or garden things that we all need, those basic needs, health, housing and education, those rights, the things that build our personality and character and make us appreciate the things that are really important are not valued through capitalism. The sight of a beautiful sunset, all the things which us can assail our senses on a good day that we increasingly find ourselves insulated from, we're destroying at a rate of knots. So what then finally is our predicament? As I say, it's however you want to put it, I could be at risk of sounding alarmist, but I think that's the wrong word. Alarmist sounds like an exaggeration, but these are just facts. These are just facts about our human situation, which may be alarming but that's quite different. That's objectivity. We need to be objective about our situation so that we can overcome it. I think a common response, unfortunately, to the gravity of the situation which we are co-responsible for is to deny it. And there are many ways of denying it. You can invent um, a kind of a carbon offsetting regime, for example, which manages to solve your consciousness whenever you um, take a flight, or in uh, Cameron's case, uh, he can go and do a photo op with a husky in, Ar in the Arctic. Uh, God knows whether that piece of ice is there anymore. Some years ago as he became leader, and that's his way of showing that he cares, but he doesn't. So there are many artifices, ways of denying and saying that there's business as usual, like there's no tomorrow, but somehow we actually need to get a grip with it. Um, if I can just add here, this is not necessarily Green Party policy, it's just my own thought at this point about... Um, how I think uh, we get into this trap of denying, and uh, for sure that's a, uh, a common problem. I think there's a kind of a, uh, a tendency to over psychologize our predicament, um, to say somehow that it's too painful to admit it. And what we're doing then is a kind of a, a post Freudian tendency to reduce everything, including the problems that we ourselves have caused in the world, to reduce it to a kind of subjective state in us. And that then allows us to beg off on our responsibilities and say, well, it's too painful for me to deal with, and in my world, I'm just going to have to ignore it or forget about it. But what we're really doing there, and what we have to get better at, is to say, no, that isn't going to prevent us. The fear of listening or understanding what we're co-responsible for. That difficulty, that psychological difficulty, isn't going to stop us from telling it as it is. And moreover, it isn't going to prevent us from tackling the problem which we ourselves are responsible for. And what really have we become that we're prepared to say that it's too difficult to look at, that it's too difficult to see the consequences of our actions, compared to 
the negative impact and deaths that it's actually causing today. So the economy then, I'm sure you wouldn't dissent from this, but I think it's worth debating how we change it. The economy is a convention as far as I'm concerned. It's a piece of paper sometimes, it's a trust, it's a bond with the state, and it's something which, depending on how that economic system is organised, the Bank of England may be more or less politicised and be instructed to print some more money, call it quantitative easing if you want, sounds good, it's going to trickle down and help those who are most impoverished, not at all. But it's a convention. You can't eat a string of zeros or a string of debt zeros, you can't eat that, even though it might be concentrated in the hands of a few, it's not going to get to you when you most need it. You can re-establish that convention. You can reform it. Some, uh, if you look at transition town movements, which is where I'm going to get to in a minute, in terms of where is the politics of the day and what's going to, what kind of transformation do we require to turn this around. If you look at uh, transition town movements uh, such as in Lewis or even in Brixton, some of them have inaugurated their own note. Have you heard about the Brixton Pound Note? Now, I'm not sure how that's been going lately. I think one of the potential mistakes that they made um, at the outset was they allowed, somehow they must have had a, a relationship going with the Bank of England, they allowed the Bank of England to back up that currency. Um, and for sure, I think that did uh, make it a far less bold a statement and a far less bold initiative. Because what you really needed to do was to say that in this community, we're going to accept this piece of paper, authenticated as it is, as our means of bartering. And we're going to say, we're not going to accept this. This note is not going to be accepted amongst a certain set of multinational companies, so you can't pay there. And we're going to decide which group of independent retailers or whatever sustainable um, retailers that we're going to be able to shop with. And it's got nothing to do with the Bank of England. And from there, we proceed. And we have some trust in what this is worth, and we have some knowledge. But it's all a convention. It's a linguistic convention, it's a social convention, it's an economic convention. And at the moment, the convention isn't working for us, it certainly ain't working for the planet. So finally, there is a, a gross lack of political will. I don't think that the solution is technological as such, although there are things that we can be doing to actually improve uh, our energy generation in terms of use of renewables, wind, wave, solar... And uh, this country, although it's uh, on paper at least maybe the sixth richest country, is bottom five in the league table across the EU for use of renewables, and that's deplorable. But we also need to fix our overconsumptive habits. Uh, that ain't necessarily going to be easy, particularly when we've got other people around us carrying on like there's no tomorrow. And, but that takes a certain amount of will, political will. And some of that can be brought about through... Uh, leaders, and we don't think the Green Party does believe there is a role, for sure, for electoral politics, if only because at the moment it's like one step, one step forward, two steps back or less, or, or sorry, more. Uh, that's become a fairly, fairly ludicrous situation. But the political will that I think ultimately is going to get us out of this trouble is social. When we look at the uh, Occupy movement, when we look at the vitality of all generations getting involved in that, having critiques, having set up lectures outside St. Paul's and other places. And to say, um, post-election, for example, to say that enough is enough and that we need to ensure that we have a society which governs for the good of all, that politics is where the vitality is. That's where the social change and transformation is going to come from. We can look to the Paris talks in December, but... Remember how we looked to Copenhagen, it was in 2009. And where did that get us? We must not and we cannot get sucked into this per perpetual postponement. Um, as James Lovelock has, has put it, actually, although we don't agree with all his politics in terms of um, renewable energy uh, and just trying to buy time through the use of nuclear, we don't think that should be an option either. James Lovelock has described it as a war footing. That's the kind of situation that we're faced with. So it's not about just finding better ways of generating energy. It's about reducing our consumption. It's about energy efficiency. It's about a Green New Deal, green jobs, trying to roll out energy efficiency, but also living 
within our means and having a proper reckoning of what that means. So I hope there's uh, plenty to debate there, not just in terms of uh, our vision and value, which I, I hope is reasonably uh, persuasive and something that I think we need to be able to do to try and overcome the current mess and for sure crisis that capitalism has contributed to in uh, the planet today. Thank you. Yeah, look, very interesting uh, discussion. I think I should just, um, not correct, but qualify. I don't think I was claiming, and I couldn't have, because I was saying how woefully inadequate our use of renewable energies was. So I do want us to invest in wave, wind, and, and solar, and that does require technology. I think the thing that I was... Uh, criticising was an assumption which perhaps Adam didn't mean either but when he opened up with the idea about technology um, that tends to ring alarm bells for me and, I, and here's why because technology is often used as a kind of way of carrying on business as usual, whether you're talking about fracking for example as a, as a more actually energy intensive fossil fuel industry it's a way of buying time or carrying on business as usual and um, so, and I also, I don't uh, withdraw from the claims about overconsumption being the problem because, although I will challenge this idea that it's marginalising the poor, I think that's a ludicrous connection to want to make. The trouble with overconsumption, whether it's inbuilt redundancy or us being made to feel that our mobile phones need replacing, uh, gone are the days when the mobile phone would actually ring when you needed it, so I keep telling my wife. But the thing is, is that overconsumption requires raw materials. In addition to the energy which you're expending to, put, to bind those things, in, in addition to the plastics which you're using, those technologies are being used wholesale. And if we're trying to find other means of energy generation and we're trying to develop technologies which allow us just to carry on at that level of consumption and carbon consumption, then anything that we've saved in one area through the actual energy generation is going to be lost through the continued consumption. Um, and I think we do need to bite the bullet about how much is it actually affecting the quality of our lives deep down when we are carrying on in that way. And isn't, aren't we actually alienating ourselves from the things that give quality to our lives? And again, I don't think that Marx, although he may carry on to talk about in his own day those particular... Um, class problems, yes, a lot of which still persist today, I don't think that the generalisation he was making uh, was not by him intended as one about human nature. And that's what human nature assumptions and generalisations generally are. There are problems about us as a species in how we think psychologically and are prone, the difficulties that we're prone to succumb to. So I think you would, you know, I think you're selling um, Marx short there by claiming that you know, we can't generalise these claims. And in terms of the, um, you know, the, this kind of battle that we're facing, this struggle, again, I don't think that you want to think of it, um, even imaginatively, as turning, the, turning everything upside down as such. I've said, you know, if you went through what I've been saying, you, I probably talked about social transformation quite a lot. I even alerted, to it, alerted you to it right at the beginning. And by that, I do not mean turning society on its head. No. That's not good enough. That's not enough. And that just reproduces and replicates a different kind of inequality. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that? I think at the heart of um, what I'm saying here is, is that people, everybody, you and I, people in groups who are currently misguided, pursuing wealth at the expense of others who need help, they're misguided. I don't think that they're morally unreachable. I might even be persuaded to shake Tony Blair's, Blair's hand if I think it might save one Iraqi life, or bring short, cut short um, bombs raining upon innocents' heads. So no, I think we need to be more radical than that. We're not just talking about, so why, how is it social transformation to turn things upside down? All you're doing is you're changing the position of people in society. Egalitarianism, social equality, even as such that I have uh, the model that I gave you about carbon quotas, it's not saying that you can't um, fly necessarily. And for sure we'd want to try and develop technologies um, which reduce th those carbon emissions. It's saying that it's not okay for some people in society to enjoy such obscene wealth 
that they can go and they can fly at the expense of the rest of the planet as much as they like. So it's egalitarian in that sense. But it is putting the responsibility in the right place. It is saying, unfortunately, we might all have to look, not just as a society, but as individuals, at our carbon consumption. Um, so technology, it does have a use, but we have to be careful. It's not, the point I was making is that for me, right now, it's not about trying to develop and harness new technologies even the renewable technologies are still here, it's about political will. Even global, tackling global poverty, that's a question of political will. We have the biomass there, we choose to feed it to cattle in order to eat meat due to our addiction to meat. How many of you, if you're um, walking the walk, are, are fond of coffee? Do a little bit of research about how uh, people, farmers around the world, are at the clutch of the West's addiction, the West's addiction and overconsumption of coffee. So, you know, we're all responsible here as ethical consumers, if you like, but more than that, structurally, we need to be clear that it's not simply about changing position with people. And that's where the, the, the idea of potentially of envy comes in. It's not to do with changing position and having some other people below us. Why would we want to do that? That's not enlightened. What we want is to create a society which everybody can agree upon is fair. Wherever you were in that society, if you were if it, unknown to you, you didn't know your position in that society, where you were born, that you'd happen to be born in the wrong place at the wrong time, you would want to make it guaranteed for everybody who was about to be born that they would have able to live a minimally decent life. Um, finally, there's so many questions. Oh, green tie. Yeah, I'm glad you knew about that. Um, that was pulled, and I think, uh, I think there's, there's a, there is a problem here. In the same way, there's a conflict. I agree. Uh, come to Green Tinus in a minute. But we're producing literature, general election literature, during the, during, during the election. You know, we're put, stuffing things through people's doors. And you know, parties tend to think there's a bit of a correlation between the amount of literature they stick through your, board, through your, your door and um, the number of votes they like to get. And that's unfortunate. Because every time, you know, whether it's sustainable resources or whatever, we are using paper when we do that. And you might say, well, that's not pure enough. That's not pure enough for the Green Party, yes? Uh, you shouldn't be using any paper at all. Just stick to social media, internet, all the rest of it. But we do. So there's a compromise. So I think what we're... The problem that you... you sorry, was it you about the green tie? I think that, that the problem there with... You might say we shouldn't be using paper whatsoever because it's contrary to our principles. The problem there is that, OK, we'll use it sparingly. We won't go overboard with it. Same with raising funds to be able to launch a credible campaign. You might say that we shouldn't be going to donors who happen to have uh, um, money that they want to commit to us and trying to get them to a meeting. I think the main problem, a dinner, the main problem with that, and uh, there was a lack of proper, I think, internal communication on that one, and that's why we pulled that event. But I agree with that. I agree with the pulling of the event. Because one of the things, and it's not just a PR thing, it's not just that it would look bad. The very idea that you would have people coming to a meeting like that and p potentially having greater access to key people in the party. I'm not sure whether I was even invited, but anyway, that's another story. But I think the thing is, is that, yes, you're right. But we need to think. It's not easy. It's not easy, yeah? You may have to get your hands dirty to some extent. I think the real difficulty in politics is um, to work within a system which we know is bankrupt and failing us and to try and reform it from within without ourselves um, getting tarnished, not just tarnished, but corrupted. That is the real danger. That is how power corrupts. We've seen it in the best of people. I think I tend to hold, um, I quite have quite some esteem for Tony Blair, Tony Benn, uh, not Tony Blair, Tony Benn, yes. Well, Tony Blair even, actually, if you read his book, you should, um, A Journey. It should be called, entitled, subtitled, The Man Who Lost His Way. Here's somebody who was engaging in, in deep debate, philosophical debate, I think with Gordon Brown in his university days, which of course he had fee, uh, fees waived and all the rest of it, you can see how, you can see it happening. It's almost like um, you've got insight, you know, you're, a psycho, on, on, you're a psychoanalyst. And I read it because I'm constantly calling for Blair's you know, tribunal on the International Criminal Court. And I just wanted a check from the man himself that he wasn't going to produce some argument or some, something that I had missed. And it's quite interesting because, you know, he's got a brain, he's got a political brain. It was probably him pulling the string with the Aster Campbell and all the rest of it. So it's insightful in terms of how politics worked. But when it got to that point, I was partly relieved 
I wanted him to be able to say something. And he, he had the intellectual capacity to produce an argument, but he didn't. But at that point, I thought, at least I would now not... Um, I would not uh, foreclose the option of speaking to the man at some stage and saying, look, by your own lights, with your own rationality and empathy, do you not see... Do you not see, as George Galloway might have put it, you would have seen the guilt written on his face as they went to Iraq. It seems there's something deep down. That's what I'm interested in. I don't think that people... We should think of people as morally beyond reach. We want to use our rationality and persuasive skill to say, you need to come with us as well. This is a journey. This is a journey, unlike him, the man who lost his way, that we need to pursue together. So back to Tony Benn. Tony Benn, the late Tony Benn. He often said that this is not a protest. Have I got 10 minutes left? I already had 10 minutes. Wow. I, didn't, I wasn't even planning to have 10 minutes, so that's great. This is not a protest. This is a demand. That's the kind of vitality we need back in politics. Through you, I don't know, many of you may be at university. A university is not about the more you learn, the more you earn. It's about the more you learn, the more you learn. Because what you bring to your minds and to your vision of the world, that's incalculably more important yeah, than your bank balance. Because that will enable you and people, your contemporaries and people after you, to change society for the common good. Okay, well, I just want to thank Sharar again for coming. Um, I think it's been an excellent discussion. Um, and, of course, it's a discussion is ongoing. Um, and I uh, hope, uh, hope to see you on a panel again uh, at future events. But the, ma the main uh, question I want to come back on is um, not so much the overconsumption thing. I mean, let's, let's put to the side whether or not, uh, whether it's us in this room who are responsible uh, for... for you know, living beyond our means, as, as it was put. You know, even if we accept that fundamental premise, which I actually you know, disagree that we, that we are the, the, the ones responsible, that we're the ones living beyond our means, but let's put aside that, um, that, that, that first premise and say, say we are. Say all of us here are, are living beyond our means. All of us on this, in, in the advanced capitalist world are responsible. How do we go about resolving this? How do we go about actually tackling that problem? How do we go about deciding uh, what is produced, how it is produced, and uh, in what quantities, and what, 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 what living standards we have? What, how do we decide who gets what and, and how much uh, of it they get? And I think that is the fundamental problem that we face, is that we, who might be the one who might be, let's suggest it's true, might be the ones who uh, are over-consuming, how do we go about actually uh, tackling the, that, that problem. And I would say the key barrier in this respect is the question of ownership. It's the question of private ownership. It's the fact, and that is a class question at the end of the day, that even if we wanted to do something about our living standards, even if we wanted to do something about changing the way in which uh, we lived and way, in way in which production was run and so forth, we have no control over that process. We have no say in that uh, whole element of, uh, of society. The only real decision making we can do uh, as individuals is, uh, is what we buy and, uh, and who we vote for, really, at the end of the day. That's the, the, the main decisions we have in capitalist society. And on the question of what we buy, well, um, I mean, if, if, if we were to all just consume less, then that's basically a recession. I mean, that's, uh, if we, if, under capitalism, if we all decided to stop consuming tomorrow, then what would happen? You'd have a load of factories closed down. You'd have a load of people being uh, unemployed. Basically, the minute the, 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 all these commodities that capitalism's churning out aren't sold, that, that is basically a recession. That is capitalism going into crisis. So we, we wouldn't actually uh, feel the benefits of it. And if anything, we would send society into just a, a, a bigger slump. I agree that, that, that we should have an economy where the goods that are produced, um, basically the, 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 the amount they're produced and, and how much they cost, and so forth, it should reflect the, uh, the environmental uh, pollution and so forth that, that's contained within them. But under capitalism, that isn't the case. Under capitalism, capitalism is a system where production is for profit, where the commodities that are, that are out there, the prices, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a race to the bottom, as I said earlier. It's, it's competition. Drive, you know, driving down costs actually, and actually trying to uh, pollute more where it means making it cheaper. 
Um, but so really the only way to actually have this economy where things are based uh, around the, their actual environmental destruction would be to fundamentally transform the whole laws of the economy, uh, which is obviously what socialists call for. But, um, but, that, but the, the, the key problem with the whole how much we, you know, choosing by how much we buy is obviously the fact that it's not an equal choice. Those who, uh, those who have more, or in terms of wealth, obviously get a lot more say in society. So what's the other way in which we can decide? Well, we can choose who we vote for. But as I said earlier, the problem even then is, even if you vote in a government that wants to really make a difference and even has the, the best of intentions on the environment and any other social questions, we see that actually it's not governments that control industry and finance, but it's industry and finance that control governments. I mean, where point to one point in the program of, uh, of Syriza, a radical left party, who, whose program on, on the surface of things isn't that dissimilar from the Greens, actually, in terms of living wage, uh, uh, you know, key, key questions of pensions and housing and, and so forth, public services, doesn't fundamentally differ the, the Syriza uh, leadership from, from that of uh, what, uh, what the Green Party puts forward in their manifesto. But they haven't been able to carry out a single one of those demands in Greece because at the end of the day, they're held by the throat by the bankers, by the people who really control society, which is, uh, which is the bosses and, uh, and the bankers. So how do we go about really deciding then what our means are and, uh, and who gets what? I think, well, for a start, go back to the, 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 even that premise. I, again, I would, I, would, I would refute it because 90% of landfill, for example, 90% of waste that goes to landfill is not produced by households. It's produced by industry, it's produced uh, in mining, and all these basically giant corporations over which we have absolutely no control. Um, there, is, there is obviously many people living below, you know, below the uh, you know, decent living standard in terms of 5 million people on fuel poverty. But uh, if we wanted to reduce the amount of energy we consume in our homes, well, what would that mean? It would mean a mass uh, investment in insulation, a mass uh, investment uh, in, uh, in, 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 in energy efficiency technologies. And who's got, who's got the power to do that? I mean, most people can't afford to, to spend the thousands that are needed to, to, to reduce those sort of energy costs from their homes. Uh, if we all wanted to take public transport in order to reduce uh, emissions from transport, well, again, how can we do that when actually uh, prices of public transport are going up, when there's less and less investment in public transport, and all these things? In other words, all the key questions of how we could actually go about reducing our energy consumption, of how we could go about tackling this problem of overconsumption, if, it, if indeed it even existed, all of these are actually beyond us as individuals because uh, we fundamentally are not in control of our own lives, of society. And I think it goes back to, to a point that Sharar made actually about the fact that we are alienated. We are, uh, we, we are only basically connected uh, in society through, uh, through commodities, through uh, prices, through the market. We relate to each other and to the whole of the world around us as, um, as, as money basically, as, as commodities. Uh, we're completely divorced from our world. We're alienated from our surroundings. And the way to tackle it is, is to give people a sense of control over their own lives. And that means a sense of economic control. I mean, just a couple of anecdotes, actually. Um, I was in uh, Egypt just after the Arab Revolution had taken place. And I spoke to some people in Tahir Square. And they said to me, some, what I thought was very profound, actually. They said, uh, you know, you look around today and uh, Tahir Square is very clean. It was very, uh, very tidy. There's no, no litter anywhere, no graffiti, uh, other than revolutionary murals and things like that. But, and, and they said it wasn't always like this. This city used to be filthy. It used to be disgusting because it wasn't our city. It, was, it didn't belong to us. So we had no control over it. We, had, we didn't feel like it was, it was where we lived, even though obviously it, it was them who, who suffered from all the pollution, the litter, the traffic and so forth. But they said, no, with the revolution, because of those, those weeks they spent in Tahir Square, it became their city, it became their square, and they took ownership over it. They started to, to, to self-organize, to clean the communities, to keep it a, a, a tidy environment to live in. Because it was fundamentally them who were suffering. And it was, but it was the, that revolutionary act of coming together, of actually of consciousness changing through struggle, that, came, that gave them a sense of, of, of overcoming that alienation. In, uh, you see the same thing in occupied factories. In Venezuela, for example, there's, uh, there was a factory that made ceramics. And the ceramics factory used to pollute the entire surrounding village. 
Uh, and basically, it was the, again, it was the working people in that factory who had to suffer it and their families because of this dust that caused all sorts of diseases and health problems. But that factory was closed down. The, 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 the owner said uh, it wasn't profitable. The workers took it over. They occupied it as part of the, uh, the wave of factory occupations as part of the, the Venezuelan revolution. And what it did was it profoundly changed consciousness. The first thing those people did when they occupied was tackling the pollution, was tackling the dust that was surrounded. Because, it, again, it was affecting their communities, whereas the rich, the, the previous bosses, did, lived in entirely different you know, mansions far away from the pollution. In other words, once you give working class communities, once you give ordinary people the actual ability to go about solving these problems, they do it. Because, but it, the first thing is required is actually giving them the control and the ability to do so. And that's why, uh, as, as Marxists, we call for the fundamental question has to be this question of private ownership, has to be tackling that problem. Because we're not saying that after a socialist revolution, everything's going to be green the next minute, that we're going to solve all the problems. We'll have resolved the fundamental problem that stands in the way, which is the class struggle and the, the question of class ownership. But we'll still obviously have that contradiction of man versus nature. We'll still have to overcome uh, the problems of scarcity where they exist. We'll have to come to overcome the problems of environmental destruction and pollution where they exist. But at least for the first time, we'll have removed that barrier that stops us now from overcoming those problems. And uh, Shara made one comment about you know, supporting small businesses and, uh, and, and local producers and so forth. And I would just say, well, yes, well, obviously we need to support uh, those kind of middle classes who've been impoverished by capitalism, who are crushed by big business. But I think the way to go about it is not to boycott the big businesses, but rather to say, let's take these businesses over. Let's put them under a rational plan of production where we can actually go about solving this problem. There's already an enormous level of planning within these firms. The only problem is, at the moment, it's used so that they make bigger profits, whereas we would use it to address social needs, to get rid of the anarchy of the market, to get rid of the, uh, the competition of capitalism, and to once and for all be able to set about on a path where we can actually solve the real fundamental problems facing humanity.